Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is Sonship Establishment, and this is session 61. Now, let me take you immediately to the verses that we're looking at in this section of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. This is the second division of the scriptures that we've been looking at since our sonship orientation. It's only two verses long, but here it is. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, considering that we're coming back from a break, I just want to make sure that we're all thinking about the same thing and that we have our minds focused on the part of this verse, uh, this passage that we really need to be looked at. Now, so let me just kind of recap this in a quick one, two, three style. Number one, prayer is absolutely essential to the believer. And the reason is because your sonship education is not going to be able to take place without it. Remember, we covered that in that last two sessions before we, we took our break. And, and in fact, the way the Bible says it is that if we're not involved in that, we will not find the knowledge of God. Does anybody remember what that was referring to, the knowledge of God? That's the, right, it's the, correct, it's the sonship education. You're, that's what that's referring to. And so without sonship prayer, that's not going to happen. Now I know, I haven't told you yet how that works. In other words, well how is it that I'm not going to be able to get educated without sonship prayer? Aren't you up here leading us through the curriculum? Well, I am, but you understand what I'm doing <laughs> I don't want to talk myself out of a job here, but what I'm doing really is guiding our thinking along these verses, but what you're doing right here, this is very important, is not in and of itself all that needs to be done in order for you to be edified and educated as a son that really is going to take place between you and your Heavenly Father. Having said that, what does that tell you? That's a very open-ended question. But if this education is going to take place between you and your Heavenly Father, what's going to have to take place? You're going to have to have a relationship. What else did I hear? You're going to have to talk with Him. And there's one other element of that I'm looking for. It's going to involve some time. You're going to have to spend time talking with him. It's going to take... Now, I'm not saying you're going to have to quit everything but your job because you're going to be spending all your time. That's not the way this works. I will explain that and, we'll, and, and we will talk about that. Now... In order, now, we're also told in this passage that we have some infirmities. And we're told what those infirmities produce. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. That's what the infirmities produce. But the infirmities are not listed for us here. But we do, but, and that means we're supposed to already know what those infirmities are. And so, Paul just comes along and says those infirmities make it so that you don't know what to ask for, but God knows about that. And he's not taken surprised by that. And by the way, if that's just written plain in the Word like that, you know what that means? That's true for every single one of us. There's not one of us that would come to Romans 8, 26 and 27 and go, well, that doesn't apply to me. That statement is going to be absolutely true for all of us. And I am going to talk about that issue as well. But your father knows about that and anticipates that, and so he makes uh, a provision for that. The Spirit makes intercession for us according to the will of the Father. And so we also found out that the Father 
has a role in sonship prayer. That this kind of prayer is different. This is not just about, I've got my laundry list of things that I want to call off to God that I need Him to do. And now just, you know, and when I get through, in Jesus' name, amen, and now I'm finished. And now I'm just going on my merry way and we'll see what happens and what doesn't. That's not it. He has a role to play, and it's called the searching of the heart. And we also began to look at that searching of the heart, and you should have gotten the idea from the last session we had that the way He searches our heart is not by omnipotently up in heaven, you know, looking down and x-raying our heart and doing this scan to say, well, okay, I see what's in there now. That's not what he does with sons and daughters. That's not what that is. The way that happens is he's listening to the things we're saying, and by what comes out of our mouth, he knows what's in our heart. Remember those verses? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And what he's really after in searching our heart is not to see if there's some wicked way in you. What he's really after in searching your heart is to make sure that what you're learning in the sonship education, you're getting the maximum benefit of that education. That's really what's going on with that. So he's listening. Look, have you ever given one of your kids instructions and then you said to them, now say that back to me. And now you're listening, and they may be saying it back, they think it's right, but there's a part that the way they say it, you realize they don't understand this, or they would not have said it that way. That's, what you're, that's how he's searching your heart. Which, which, by the way, that doesn't happen apart from your invitation. You're not going to pray every prayer with, I want you to search my heart. That's not going to happen every single time. But it is going to happen, and you're going to know when you should do that, and you're going to know when it's done. And, and, and really, that should be pretty exciting to think that our prayer life is going to take on that kind of a dimension, that we're actually going to ask our Father to search our heart. We're going to know when it's appropriate to do that, and we're going to know when he's through. And it won't be a sign. Now, dear God, when you're through, let a bird chirp outside the window, and then I'll know. That's not it. But we're, and we're going to get to all of those details so that this doesn't become some big mystery to you, because your father really means for this to take place. But this is the way that the father is able to assess where we are and know if this thing is really working with us or not. And that's why I'm saying the education is really going to take place between you and your father, not so much between me and you, because you know what this is? This is information. But you're supposed to take that information, and now something's really got to happen in your inner man with it. And that's, that's not going to happen between me and you. I can't edify anybody. I, I've got to get edified the same way you've got to get edified. And that's going to be with our, with our Father. Now, don't let that scare you, by the way. It kind of occurs to me that when I talk about it now, you, you, you might be panicking a little bit and thinking, oh, I, I don't know if I can do that. Well, fortunately, it won't be up to you to do that at all. <laughs> It'll be up to him. But don't worry about that because I know what, what you're really saying is this. I don't understand how that works yet, but we're going to get to all of that. And really, you won't have a problem understanding that. Now, I just want to remind you that in this passage, Paul does not say you don't know how to pray. He says you don't know what to ask for as you ought. You do know how to pray. He doesn't tell us what those infirmities are and we're expected to already know about them. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to see what those infirmities, and that's a plural, did you notice that? 
It's not just the infirmity of I don't know what to pray for. It's some infirmities that we have and the result of those infirmities are I don't know what to ask for. By the way, I know right now I'm just kind of rehearsing everything that we did at, you know, to sum up from before the break. So to get our thinking all back on track here. So now let me kind of move us forward. Those infirmities are the natural condition that every single son and daughter will find themselves in at this point in the sonship education. Don't think, oh, I've got infirmities about this because there's something wrong with me. That's not it at all. It's not a measure of you're not committed enough or you're not excited about it. That's not what's going on here. This is, this is the way it is for all of us. No matter how excited you are about being educated, no matter how much you want it, you can't avoid it. And listen carefully, it's not your fault. When you see what the infirmities are, you'll go, oh, okay, well, I feel better about that now. <laughs> because it's not like Bob has them because he's a scoundrel. He is, but that's not why he has infirmities. You're welcome. We all have these infirmities. And, uh, and that's not meant to be a measure of us in any way whatsoever. Your father knows. And that's why he can just plain old write it in the Word without any qualifier. You know, he didn't say, you'll have these infirmities if you find yourself in this condition. He just says to everybody, what, what, here, here it is, the, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. He, there is no qualifier there. Everybody's got them. Okay, now, with that being said, uh, I want to come back and tell you that when you talk about prayer, somebody give me a very basic definition of prayer. Just boil it down to its very just basic form. Don't, don't try to get fancy with it and include all the details. What is prayer? Just, it's just what? Talking to God. That's all that is. Just talking to your father, right? And here's how natural sonship prayer is supposed to be. Just like talking to your natural earthly father. When, when, when you were growing up, if there was something you didn't know, it probably occurred to you every now and then, let me go ask my dad. Now, my problem was I over-explained stuff. So they asked their mom. And she would go, ask your dad. And they go, we don't want to know that bad. Okay, forget it. But I, 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 I have this tendency, you know me. But you're, talking to your natural father is the, is the same principle that we're supposed to have in talking to our heavenly father. And it, it should be just as natural as that. And... Um, and now that leads me to something that I think I really need to talk about. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe every person in here and every person on the DVD gets this. But I'm not sure that's the case. So I have to make sure that we nail this issue down before we go any further. Because if you don't, you're not going any further no matter how much material I cover. Listen to this carefully. You are, you've heard me say it, I know you've heard me say it 25 times. You are engaged in a real, real, genuine father-son relationship with your heavenly father. It's not a pretend relationship it's not a, we're going to make believe it's like that kind of relationship. Listen to me. It really is that relationship. And you have to start looking at it from that standpoint every day. Why? Because the way you view your relationship with your Heavenly Father is the way you're going to understand your prayer life with Him. And this prayer life has to run 
on the rails of a father-son, father-daughter relationship. And it's real easy to get it off of those rails. Since this is the issue of prayer, and we're talking, I know we've done a lot of work on prayer, but since we're talking about this, you have to understand that this, this relationship is genuine. It's not contrived. It's not just a way of describing it. In other words, God's not using the father-son, father-daughter relationship to give you a general idea. He's telling you that right now, this really is the way it is. And here's how committed he is to it. He has chosen to set aside his omniscience and omnipotence. It's not that he's not omnipotent God today. Of course he is. It's not that he is not omniscient today. Of course he is. But he has chosen to set those attributes aside when it comes to dealing with you so that he's not saying... Okay, look, I, I'm, I'm not being ugly about it, but I heard someone say, not, not in this group, but I heard someone say to me, I understand what you're saying and I agree completely. I... I know the Spirit is making intercession for me because He knows what I need before I ever ask Him. When I hear that come out of their mouth, you know what I know? They're not getting it. You missed the point. I'm not being ugly about it. I'm using this to say they, have, they haven't nailed down the reality of this relationship and how that relationship works. When you come into your natural father after being gone all day and go, guess what I learned today? He doesn't say, well, I knew about that before you ever learned it, so get out of my hair. He goes, what? What did you learn? <laughs> and if you go, well, guess. You know what he's going to say? I can't guess, you moron, just tell me. <laughs> now, your father doesn't call you a moron, I get it. But, well, your heavenly father, okay, your earthly father probably does, but your heavenly father does not. And he says, he said, <laughs> he says, what? what, what do you, but, and do you know why? He's not pretending. You have to, I know your mind is going to rebel at this because you're used to, he's the omniscient God. But knowing what you have need of before you ask Him is sitting in a portion of your Bible where He's dealing with people as children under tutors and governors. When you're talking about adult, adopted children who are being trained in the business, He wants this father-son relationship so badly he says, I'm going to be just like a natural father to you. And that is, and not just like, that is how it is. And, and I determined not to know it until you tell me about it. Now, they didn't say it to me, but I heard that someone in this group did say, if he doesn't know unless we tell him, there's some things I won't be telling him about. And don't think I haven't already thought that myself. So I told on you for him. Okay, but no. I, uh, but he's really, look, that's not a contrived thing. The reason this is so hard is because of the view we've always had of God. That he is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. But not with you. And it has to be that way. Because that's the nature of a true father-son relationship. In fact, what you may not understand is that if he did operate with you out of his omnipotence and omniscience, the father-son relationship no longer stands. You may not be able to understand that yet. You will one day. That relationship can't work under those conditions. It can't. 
And that's why the searching of the heart, your, I'm talking about adopted sons and daughters, only happens at your invitation. Remember we ran those references and on the wicked, you remember what God does? He sits up in heaven and he x-rays their whole heart. They have no way of controlling that. But with sons, you know what he's waiting on? Look here. If you don't know what to ask for as you ought, if he was going to deal with you out of his omnipotence, why does he need the Spirit to make intercession for you? Wouldn't he just know? You see, these verses become ridiculous under omnipotence and omniscience. See, if God's just reading everything about you because He knows it all, He doesn't need the Spirit to make intercession for you with groanings which cannot be uttered. Because here's the one thing you know for sure. You don't know what the Spirit said. So it didn't do you a bit of good. And if He already knew, why had the Spirit even do it? Do you see that? Do you really? Or are you just nodding so I'll move on? This is, this is the perfect picture of what I'm talking about. Your father is saying, if you don't say it to me, I won't know. But we've got a problem. We don't always know what to ask for. But God says, okay, here's how I'm going to fix the problem. He could fix it this way. Don't worry, I'll just gaze into your heart and I'll just know. Instead, here's what he says. The Spirit is going to make intercession for you. And I'm going to hear the thing you don't yet know what to ask for. I'm going to hear that from the Spirit. And when I hear that from the Spirit, I'm going to know what to do. Now, I know how that sounds. Probably every fiber of your being is revolted. Yes? Go ahead, go ahead, Let, ask a question. He, he is, he also his omnipresent is also, he's not using it that way either. And, but the Spirit is, is using all of those powers itself. Is that what's going on? I'm, I'm not sure what you're talking about when you're saying he's not using his omnipresence. Make a conversation with him. Right. Only for, only for the things that you don't know what to ask for. Okay. The rest of that, you're going to carry on a conversation. For instance, let me just give you an idea, and I think this will answer your question. Can you say to your father, I am really wanting to get the sonship education, and the more I see about it, the more I see your wisdom and how you've constructed it, and I, I just think this is great. You don't need the Spirit to do anything with that. You, you, you know exactly what you're saying and you're just conveying it to your father. It'd be just like saying to your father sometimes, think of a father now in the relationship we're talking about. It's not just father-son, but it's an adopted son or daughter who's now being educated by a father in the family business. And can you see a son coming along and saying to his father, you know, you've really put this together in a a brilliant manner. The more I learn about what you've done here, that's just genius. Can you see a son saying that? And see, the Spirit doesn't, doesn't get involved because this is a temporary condition. He doesn't mean that permanently the Spirit is going to be doing this. That's the other fallacy in our thinking. We're still under that old the priesthood of the, of the believer and somebody's making intercession for us because we read this verse but we didn't understand the whole context of it. There's going to come a day when the Spirit's not going to make this intercession for you because you're going to know exactly what to ask for as an educated son and you're not going to need the Spirit to do that anymore. And that's a mark of maturity that you'll come to. But, yeah, but that doesn't affect our relationship. The relationship is really in, and remember that's why I had you say those answers a while ago, it's in communicating with him. 
You know, and I talk about, give me the basic of prayer. It's talking to Him, you know. And, and when we talked about that issue, that's really the issue that's at stake. And so what He's saying is this. If you don't tell me, I've determined not to know it. So when you go, well, that's fine, because I understand that's how the real relationship would work. Otherwise, there would be no need for communication at all. You know, if he were just going to use his omniscience, he would just look at you and say, well, I know everything Bertha needs, so I'm just, I'm just going to respond to that, you know, you know, and do it like that. But see, that, that requires no relationship. He can do that from heaven, and, and she doesn't need him to search. She doesn't need to say anything. She, she could go through her whole life without praying. See, no relationship. Don't you find, well, here's how I know. I had a great relationship with my dad, so this is real easy for me to get. The more time we spent together and the more we talked, the closer I felt. So that when I didn't have that time, I missed it. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Now your father is going to come along and you're, you're actually going to, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. There's an element of this that I know is causing you a little bit of um, question. And I haven't told you this element yet. And when I, t it, it is, now, well, let me just say it like this for now, bud, because I think you've gotten most of your answer here. This is a temporary condition. It's not going to continue forever. And it's just in some things that you don't know what to pray for as you ought. Everything else, he's not interceding for you. You're talking to your father directly. Okay? When he says, we know not what we should pray for as we ought, what I haven't told you yet, but plan to today, is that he's talking about something very specific, not just prayer in general. He has something very refined and pointed in mind when he says, there are some things you don't know what to ask for. Actually, you may right now, right now you may be saying, well, there's a lot of things I want to ask him and I'm not really sure how to ask him. But he's really not talking about just prayer in general. He has something... Um, That some, I don't know how to say it, just say it's specific. And that's the thing I haven't told you yet. Because I'm just trying to nail down before we get there. He's gone to great lengths to establish an actual, genuine, working, real father-son relationship in every way. So when your father comes to, you know, when you come to him in prayer... You can't just say, well, I, I know you already know everything. Because when we became adopted sons, he determined not to know that. That forces us into this relationship. How else, by the way, will his heart be instilled in your heart? You know, I'll give you an example. This is a bad example. But we had this covered two car carport at our house when I was growing up had a the, remember the old metal trash cans you used to have when you was a kid and the garbage men could make more noise than a marching band with them and uh, we had those underneath there and we had some other stuff some lawn chairs and stuff under there and my mom would pull her car under there my dad was forbidden to pull his car under there because he might ding my mom's door and uh, but anyway <laughs> All of that was under there. And so her car was out, and Dad said, let's sweep, because the leaves would blow up and all that. And he'd say, let's sweep off the carport, because the house is on this side, storage room on this side. So it formed kind of a corner, and stuff would blow into that corner. So here's what I did. I took the broom, and I swept everything off of that carport. Here's what my dad did. He came out, and he lifted up that, I went and I said, I'm done. He came out, and he lifted up those cans, and he said, what about that? I didn't move the cans, I swept around them. In fact, I swept around everything. I didn't move a thing. And here's what he told me. This job isn't done until it's done all the way. He said, don't halfway do it. Move stuff. 
sweep under it. Now, I have never forgotten that lesson. And I couldn't wait till the day I had kids <laughs> where I could exact my vengeance on them in the same way. Actually, he wasn't ugly about it at all. But you understand, he was teaching me. You know that? And you know what? That only came by spending time with him and listening to him. You know, actually, you know what he did? It was kind of like the sonship education. I came back and I did what I did, and then he's coming to me. Now he's going to talk to me and say, let's see if you're really getting everything out of this you're supposed to get. Now, true, it's a bad illustration because it's not just, just talking. I mean, I'm sweeping, but you understand? He's looking at that and he's saying, I see something here that indicates to me that you don't get the whole concept of what it means to clean stuff off. So that has stuck with me. So I make sure that Billy moves all the cans from now when we, she cleans up. But you, you, you see what I'm saying. Uh, okay, now I'm going to fill in a blank for you here. <laughs> That it, it, and so just kind of keep that question in your mind, but I need to ask a question at this point. In a real father-son relationship, tell me what you think are the characteristics or the attributes of that relationship. And I can ask this question a little different way. In what way is a father-son relationship different from the other ways of seeing your relationship with God. Now both of those are asking the same question. Give me a word that describes a real father-son relationship. Okay. Mm. Okay. I'm sorry. Love? Oh, okay. Closeness? That one's not working very good. Uh, what else? There's a cup, there's about three. I'm sorry, Teresa? Understanding. Understanding. Acceptance? Somebody over here has something? Uh, let me, let's, let's do a different relationship. One of creator God to created man. You know, creator to creation. Look, can we still love God in that? Can we still be sincere? We can. Can, these are not wrong answers. Can we uh, now closeness? There's an element of that. Oh, good. Okay. Now, now I'm moving you in the direction I really want to move you. Personal. Give me another word for that. It's more personal. It's. This is really the direction I'm trying to guide this whole thing. I, I don't want you to just guess for 10 minutes, but I'm really hoping that you'll come up on these words. There's three words that I'm really looking for. I'm sorry? Connected. Connected? That's that, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who said intimate? Oh, Norma. Intimate. Now, I'm not saying these other words don't work. They do. But look. This is a more intimate relationship. Think with me. Look, a guy may be the king of a country and he may rule with an iron fist. Yes? But when his kids come in, you know what they do? They crawl in his lap, they put their arms around their neck, and they call him daddy. You know what that means? That's a whole different relationship than everybody else has, isn't it? The father-daughter, father-son relationship has intimacy to it that the other relationships do not carry. And now listen, I'm not just trying to be ugly, but the way you perceive your relationship guides your prayer life. 
And for most of my life, and I'm sure for yours too, the churches we came up in, no matter what church it was, kind, kind of, they didn't tell us things that weren't true, but what they didn't do is they didn't guide our thinking to think about the intimacy of a father-son or father-daughter relationship. It was always of Almighty God and worm of a man. I'm not saying we're on par with God. What I'm telling you is, when you came to Jesus Christ, He put you in a whole different relationship. Is He the creator of heaven and earth? Yes. Are we just a creation? Yes. But <coughs> it's more than that. He is our Father. You are His son or daughter. That's the relation. Even the songs. Look, I just, I just picked some out. Look, even these songs. Look at this. This is one of the common praise songs today. I'm not saying the things in here are bad. They're not. They're not intended to be bad at all. They're intended to praise God. And that's okay. But they almost all come out of the earthly kingdom idea. And none of them will teach you the father-son relationship you're actually in. Take a look. I will sing praise to you, for you are mighty in all your ways. What attribute does that speak of? His omnipotence, His power. Now, that's, that's a true thing, but you have to understand, in your relationship, God has set that aside. This does not lead you to start thinking about your relationship the way He's established it. I put my trust in you, for you're the guardian of all my days. What does that say? He's superintending everything that happens. But you know what? He's not. He's not. Somebody's kid got run over. You think God was the guardian of that? Don't be foolish. But this is the implication. I know where this comes from. It comes out of the Old Testament under the Israel program. And by the way, he's talking about something a little different over there. Look, Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, ruler of sky and sea. You know what this, I understand what they're doing. They're building up God. But what the only point I'm making, I'm not saying you can't ever acknowledge God's greatness, but the thing you you don't have in your mind that you've got to get is that that is not how he's dealing with you. Because if that's how you think, that's how you're, you're going to pray just like that. And you know what that means? You are never going to get this sonship education. Because without sonship prayer, it doesn't go forward. And if you don't pray like a son... You're not going to get educated as a son. That makes sense? That's why I'm being dogmatic about this. Yes? If we look at him like that, that wouldn't be like looking at him as a son. Would it? As a, no, we wouldn't be looking at him as a father. And he's not looking at us as a son. You know, he's looking at us as a great, omnipotent maker of heaven and earth, ruler of sky and sea. And, you know, you know. It almost reminds me, I'm the great and powerful Oz, you know. How dare you come before me? You, you, you know, I mean, that's how, God never is like that. You do understand. But I'm saying, when you see your relationship that way... But not when, even with the Oz, the relationship that they've had between, between them and the great and powerful Oz, and then when it was them and Oz himself, you know, that relationship... It did, it changed. He was just annoyed. It was like he was a guy, he was giving him the balloon. Right, right, it did, it changed, right. Look, and yet, see the and yet? Now understand that this is not untrue. None of this is untrue. He is the maker of heaven. I, I, I get that. And yet you care for me. I give you praise, I give you praise, I lift your name on high. And yet, it's almost like, in spite of the fact that you're so great and you're up there and I'm so unworthy and I'm down here, you have stooped down to do that. He's done much more than that. You know what he did? He pulled you up and he made you a son and a daughter. You can't think of that this way. Look, just so you know it's not an anomaly, 
I'll sing praise to you for you're the king of creation. Do you see the same kind of thing going on? I put my trust in you for you're the hope <coughs> of the nations. That's a millennial issue on this earth, not up there. Folks, you're not involved. I know where that came from in the Bible. You're never going to be involved in that. <coughs> you're going to be in the heavenly places. He is the hope of the nations, but that's in Israel's program on this earth. Not up where you're going to be in the creature. I, I know these are great. I, I know, and I know what their intent is. I'm not trying to malign anybody. What I'm trying to show you is, even trying to do a good thing, if you're not careful, it influences your thinking and pulls you in a completely opposite direction than what your apostle is actually teaching you about. So you know what we'll do? We'll spend 40 minutes singing this kind of stuff. And if I were to get up and to teach this, on the, you know what? Someone would go, well, those things are actually contradictory to each other. I'm not saying you don't love God or you shouldn't praise Him. You, but do you see? Almighty God, maker of, uh, he of heaven and earth, ruler of sky and sea, and yet you care for me. Okay, now here's the next one. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. And then look, from every nation, all creation, bow before the ancient of days. Let me ask you, when you came into your father, does he require, did he require you to bow down to him? That's not father-son relationship. I'm not saying you ought to think of yourself to be more than you are. I'm saying you should think of yourself as how He has made you to be. If the only relationship you had with your earthly father was to come in and go, Oh, Father, I prostrate myself before your greatness. You know what my dad would have said? Are you drunk? Get up. What in the world is wrong with you, boy? Very unnatural. Right? Hey, I, again, I go to the illustration of the king. Everybody else comes in. Oh, your majesty. Here comes his daughter. Daddy! She runs and gets on his lap. You know what he does? He scoops her up. This other guy, off with his head. <laughs> okay, Amanda really loves this part of the sermon right here. Okay, but the, the, this... This relationship, folks, I'm trying to get you to see, is a real father-son relationship. It, and he has accorded it just that way. Here, look, look at this next one. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. Is that how you would... Do, someone said, describe your relationship with your dad. Well, he reigns over us with generosity. Would, is that how you would say it? You wouldn't talk about him reigning over you. These words are not wrong. Someone said sincerity and someone said love and clo Those are things that picture this relationship. I'm just trying to get you to see that it's very different. We talk about he is an awesome God. And he, he, he is, but when it comes to his relationship with you, the first word out of your mouth to describe him ought to be what? Huh? Father! He's my father. That ought to be the first word. That ought to be the first thing in your mind. You're the king, yet you're my friend. Well, I appreciate that. I got a position way better than friendship. I'm a son. Do you see? They're well-intentioned. They're well-meaning. I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to get people to think about how great God is. But do you know, in His greatness, you know what He did? All those attributes. Look at the end. You're such a big, big God. What, what are they trying to put forth there? That God is overweight? Or, no. What are they really putting forth? What's the real idea? That He's powerful. There's nothing He can't do. But in His greatness, here's what He did. He set those attributes all aside to make sure that the way He deals with you is like a, a real father and a real son. Does that make sense? It's comfortable. Yeah. Oh, whoa, 
Oh, oh, I'm so glad you said, I sound like a monkey then, didn't I? Sorry. I didn't think about how that sounded until it came out. Okay. Ye yes, you're comfortable because that's the second word that's close to the second word that I wanted you to get to. In fact, let me just, let me just say, man, we are just not very far in this, are we? Wow. Okay, when we come back from the break, I want to talk about this word and one more that talks about this father-son relationship. Because the word I had in mind, and I'll go ahead and give you the notes because I've asked you the questions that I wanted to kind of get you thinking about, is a, there's a casualness to the relationship. And by that, I don't mean disrespectful. I respected my dad. But you know what? I could tell my dad things I couldn't tell anybody. That was the relationship. He knew things I could never tell my friends because they would think I was not cool. What, you're afraid of that? Well, my dad would never do that. I could trust him with anything I could say, and I knew it. And there was a casualness, but I always respected him. I didn't look at him as just, I mean, you know what? He was, there was that closeness. I'm not saying God is one of the boys. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying here? But this relationship has a casualness, a comfort to it. Because I can remember when my, when my thought of a relationship was almighty God and insignificant me, I was always in prayer groveling before him and humbling and, and, and you know, exalting him and debasing me and, and I'm not worthy and oh God, you know, why would you ever waste your time with me? I understand how you feel about that and you know when you look at what he did for us you know you, you kind of think that but here's what he did he changed that relationship it's not like it was with Israel with Israel I am the Lord thy God fear me that's the oh God I, I don't, oh if, you, if you'll just indulge me your humble servant that's the relationship of that Here's the relationship we have. Abba, which is that term of intimacy and affection. It's like pop or, you know, pop or daddy. It's that kind of deal. It's that closeness. Okay, there's one more word. We'll give it to you after the break. All right. And then I have something earth-shattering to show you. You'll love it. it. And it'll address the end of Bud's question. So we'll do it after.